Okay, video number 11 out of the Schneider TM3 series. We're going to be taking a look at wiring analog voltage inputs, 0 to 10 volt or minus 10 through plus 10, on a TM3 expansion module. So we're going to go and pick a specific module. The one that we're going to examine inside of here is going to be the TM3 AI2, but the wiring that we follow on this one could also be expanded out to the AI4 or the AI8. Both of these are exact same concept, just going to have a few more components that are going to be a few more options for inputs that we can bring into them. Let's start with the data sheet. The data sheet is going to give us some information about the actual processors we can attach this to. We see that we can attach it to a 241, 251, 221, or a 262. The specific module that we're looking at has only got two inputs that are going to be available to it, and those inputs are going to be either voltage, which is what we're going to be looking inside of this video, or alternatively, there's going to be current, but we'll do a separate video for the current ones. If you're looking for voltage, they can take it 0 to 10 volt or minus 10 through positive 10 volt as their analog values. And then there's a bit more detailed information that's also given under the complementary section. Uh, one of the big things is going to be the analog input resolution. It's going to be a 16-bit It's a resolution. That means that you're taking that entire scale of 0 to 10 uh, volts and you're going to break it across that size. This is good because a lot of your smaller PLCs, the onboard, you know, uh, that you're going to go and have is usually going to be fewer than 16 bits. So if you need to have a really precise signal, you want to go out to something that is going to give you maximum resolution. So you can see the smallest changes in your voltage that's coming in there. So 16 bits is a great range to go and have. It's going to be, you know, far beyond what most of you will ever need for accuracy in most of the industries you're working in. Uh, we can bring up to 13 volts into this thing or up to 40 milliamps current if we were doing the current one that we are going to go and have. And then they give us the least uh, significant bit of value that we are going to go and have. In other words, the smallest amount of voltage change that it's going to be able to go and register. So if I'm on the 0 to 10 volt, it's going to be able to register 0.153 of a millivolt. In other words, that is 153 microvolts as being the smallest amount of change that it's going to be able to go and run in. If I spread it across the minus 10 through positive 10 volt, then it's going to go and roughly double. And we're up to 0.305 of a millivolt, which is going to be 305 microvolts. So very, very tiny, tiny amounts of voltage change that it's going to be able to go and pick in. If we take a look at the sampling duration, uh, the sampling duration over here is going to be given as one millisecond and conversion time is going to be one millisecond plus one millisecond per channel plus the controller cycle time. In other words, I'm going to be able to go and have one millisecond of sampling plus it is going to, if I've got multiple channels open, so like two of these channels open, I'm using both of them, then it's going to be one per each channel because that's the cycle through plus the controller cycle time. This just tells you how rapidly the PLC scan time is updating the data that is going to be coming in. We do get a little bit of other uh, information just on accuracies, you know, temperature drift, repeat accuracy, nonlinearity, and things like that, that we're going to see. We'll skip past most of that because that's really minutiae except for, you know, some uh, really tight type of installations. And then we're going to go on down to this section over here where it tells us about the uh, rated supply voltage. Now, the rated supply voltage is not going to be the 0 to 10 volt. This is going to be to go and power up the card because the card itself needs to have power brought into it. 24 volts rated, it could go down as low as 20.4 and up to as high as 28.8. And then they just tell us that the cabling should be kept to under 30 meters of twisted shielded pair cable. The actual data sheet that they show for this thing also, or sorry, installation sheet shows the wiring for it. We're going to go and start by taking a look at our power supply. It shows that we need to use an external power supply. That external power supply is going to go and have fusing. That's that box that we're going to have over there. And we supply a positive to the 24 volts. We are going to go and apply our negative to the zero volts. And we see that we are also going to go and apply this thing down to ground. Now you see that little symbol over top of that one that's going to be a protected earth ground that we are going to go and have. And the reason we have that is because we are also going to go and take a look at these shields that we're going to have in our cables that we also want to have connected down to the same one. So this whole top section uh, over here is really just to go and power the internal circuit board. It just passes through from inside of there, powers up the internal circuit board that's doing the sampling of that. Then we take a look over here, IO0, or input 0, we're going to have a positive and a negative, and then input 1, we're going to have a positive and a negative. We do also see a lot of these that are going to be on here. These ones stand for no connection or not connected. Oops, sorry, i got to spell that correctly there, no connection. 
connection like that. So we're not bringing any wires into those ones. Okay. Fusing should take place just like they showed us there before. Your options are you usually go with something that's going to be a DIN rail mounted style. I suggest using either the CC fuses like this with a HCLR, which is going to be a very fast acting, or using one of these smaller ones, the narrower that take the glass or ceramic fuse. Whatever you're using, you want it to be a very fast acting fuse because you want to protect these PLC cards as much as possible. All right, and now we are on to our wiring. Let's start by just examining the wiring that we do have brought into here. At this point, we do see we have AC being carried in. That AC goes through a DIN rail circuit breaker that is then feeding into a DC power supply. That DC power supply is converting to 24 volts DC. And we see that that 24 volts DC is being fed in to power my main PLC. We'll just zoom in on the PLC now at this point. We see we're using a 251 as our head on the PLC or as our brain, the processor. And over here, we see we have got that card that is attached. We have the 24 volt, zero volt, the protective earth, the NC, NC, and then the positive negative uh, input zero, and then the positive negative input one that we're going to have off of there as well. Looking out a little bit further along our diagram over here, we see that that same positive has been brought over here to a DIN rail mounted fuse holder over here, and that we've also taken this negative over and connected that negative on over there as well. And the reason that we're bringing these over is just because we need to bring power onto this over here. So we're going to go and start by bringing power to the card itself. We'll take this positive through my fuse holder up to here. We're going to go and use a brown, which is a European standard color for positive DC. And then we're going to go and take our blue, which is going to be a European standard color for negative. And we're going to attach that in over there. And then we're going to go and take a green or a bond out of that protective earth and that is going to go down to my grounding blocks that I'm going to go and have inside of my panel. So these three lines over here have now been used to power up the actual card. Now the card can start to read stuff. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to examine our cable that we have over here. Just zoom in on that one there. We've got a red and a black, so a positive and a negative. We see that we've got an internal ground inside the cable, and then we've got that shield that's going to be around the outside as well. So we're bringing this in from a field device to go and read it. First thing that we're going to do is we're going to start by grounding down this cable. So we're going to go and take my ground in. We're also going to go and take my shield in like that. Always the shield gets grounded down at the main end. There's multiple ways to do it. There's these little clamps that are going to go and grab it, or you can, you know, strip off and tie stuff in. There's a pile of different methods that are going to be, you know, applicable that you can use for this, but you do want it to be grounded on the source end and isolated on the other end. Then I'm going to go and take in my positive and my negative. I see that I've got my red over here. It is going to go into my I positive over here. And then this is going to go into my I negative over there. And we'll just zoom in on that card like that. That's all we need to do. So now we're coming into input number one on the positive with the red and on the negative with the black. All right. Uh, when using these, probably one of the biggest mistakes that people do is that they forget that they need to go and power up the actual card up here at the top as well. You know, almost anybody out there can figure out how to go and take the zero to 10 volts in like that. It's just this remembering that you got to power up the card so it can process the signal. That's a bit tricky.